We're appreciative of your presence. We're sorry to hear of all the sickness. It seems like it's that time of year. And I guess some of us, as age has moved on us, it makes it even more susceptible. But thanks be to God and his good grace that we're able to be together this afternoon. The question I pose to you is this one. Will all good people be saved? <clears throat> now, when I hear a question like that, I ask myself the question, what do you mean by good people? What is a good person? Well, I think to be fair about it and taking the totality of the Bible on the matter, that good would have to be somebody who loves the Lord and keeps His commandments. Somebody who's faithful to the cause of Christ. Somebody who's not just a hearer but a doer of the work, this would be a good person. Now, I don't know what all people mean sometimes when they pose that question, will all good people be saved? But I do know what a lot of them mean. And I want to deal a little bit with that this afternoon. There are a lot of people who think that just so you think of God and you're part of some religion, that that's all it takes and God will accept you. About 300 years ago, a fellow by the name of George Calixtus came up with the idea, and I don't know why it would seem such a hard idea for people to come up with, they don't accept God in the Bible, but he came up with the idea that all religions are acceptable to God. If you study some of the modernistic theologians, you'll find out that they've had that view for a long time, although we don't hear much about it nowadays. If you had been studying 40, 50 years ago back, you would have heard about a lot of them saying, well, you know, you're in this country and the predominant religion is this and that's all you've ever been exposed to and you're sincere, doing your best to abide in that religion, then God's going to accept you. Of course, we have the Bible, and it's given to instruct us in righteousness. And if it doesn't have the answer to any religious question, then I don't know where we go. Do we go to uh, Buddha? Do we go to the Muslims? What do we do? But when we, of course, study the Bible and study the proofs of the Bible as to what it is, then it is the sole source of answering any religious question. Now, I know people can say, well, you're just asserting that. Well, I can't prove everything <laughs> in one sermon. So I'm assuming that the people in this audience, and I'm assuming, however it's heard later on, via the Internet or otherwise, that I'm speaking to those people who accept the God who reveals himself in the Bible and who is the father of his only begotten son, Jesus Christ. As I've said many times now, we can engage in proofs of God, proofs of the deity of Christ, proofs of the plenary verbal inspiration of the scriptures, and so on and so forth. But for now, that'll have to do. I realize that um, this idea of everybody that is involved sincerely in some sort of religion uh, is going to be saved is very appealing to folks. Uh, have you ever noticed how those things that are very easy and not very challenging to anybody on any level uh, is very appealing to a lot of folks. It's very appealing to have somebody say, uh, I'm leaving you a million dollars. You don't have to do anything for it. You just have to be the one to get it. Well, that's very appealing. It doesn't require anything of you. It doesn't require any thought processes or anything else. It just requires you to accept whatever you have to do to take that which is free. But the vital question is this, is it true? People seem to forget about the matter of truth, and yet Christianity is anchored in the idea of what is true. If uh, I were to walk up and call you a, a name that's not yours and yet act in all sincerity like that name is yours, and though you correct me, I persist in calling you that name, because I, I like it better than your own name. You'd think there's something bad wrong. 
And yet people will do that when it comes to religion. They're just going to have it their way. Must have been like that to some extent with Cain. They had been instructed in that bygone era how God wanted to be worshipped. You can't fault Cain for not worshipping. He did. Well, why wasn't it acceptable? It was not by faith, Hebrews 11, 4, Romans 10, 17. To do something by faith means the Word of God had to enter in and instruct you how to do it. And if you're faithful, you comply with whatever God required you to do. So no matter how comforting a teaching may sound, if it's not true, and in this case true according to God's good Word, then it cannot offer real comfort. It can't offer genuine hope. It can't offer real inward peace. I do know in reading my New Testament that when some who were Christians had listened to false teachers and they came to think that they needed to go back under the law of Moses in some way try to combine it with the gospel of Christ, that the inspired Apostle Paul in writing part of the New Testament said, O foolish Galatians, who did bewitch you before whose eyes Jesus Christ was openly set forth crucified? This only would I learn from you. Receive ye the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith. Then he says, Later on in chapter 5, verse 4, that's verses 1 and 2 of Galatians uh, 3, he said, Whosoever of you that are justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace. So to attempt to be justified before God, no matter how good it sounds to you, with a doctrine that's not true, he says you've fallen from the favor of God. You can't be saved. So a principle is clearly set forth here. First of all, you can't be justified before God by two different laws at the same time. That is, two different religions. Years and years ago, now 50 years ago, I guess coming up this summer when Vietnam fell, and I worked from about May till August, I believe it was. It might have been September. We lived in Van Buren, Arkansas. And one of the places they brought the people escaping Vietnam from the communists was Fort Chaffee, which is right by Fort Smith, Arkansas. And I was in Van Buren, and that was probably 30 miles away. And all through that time period, um, I went every day, Monday through Friday, and taught in the chapel there. And what was interesting is there was a, a woman who came, and you know, we never seen these folks. Some of them spoke English, but some of them didn't. She came regularly for a good while. I don't remember how long. But one day she came up after the class, and she said, I would like to ask you a question. I said, fine, love to hear it. She said, can... Can I be a Buddhist and a Christian too? <laughs> well, one reason that they're like that in that society is that they're taught to become whatever is necessary to please folks wherever you are uh, because of their viewpoint of such things as that as far as Buddhism is concerned. Well, I had to try to sit down and study with her there. And I don't frankly remember, I know she never obeyed the gospel, at least while I was there, I don't remember whether she continued to come or not. But she knew she was going to be in America and she was wanting to blend in some way or the other. On the other hand, there was a fellow there who had been a major in the Army forces in South Vietnam and he came and came and one day came forward and said, I want to be baptized. Well, we had to make special appointments because we had to use a swimming pool and they wouldn't let us go just because when we wanted to and needed to. So we had to make a special arrangement and going through the chaplain and had to get a chaplain's assistant assigned to us to get in a Jeep and go pick a fellow up where he was staying. A certain time, take him over to the swimming pool and baptize him. Well, we did that. And when we came back, they were in those barracks there where they had all the 
families until they could be sponsored and sent out somewhere else in the United States. There was his whole family on that stoop of the barracks where he entered in, and he was sitting behind me still wet. Although he dried off, he was still wet. <laughs> he leaned forward and said to me, they know I've been baptized, and when I'm coming back, I'm a Christian. They want to see if I look any different. <laughs> well, he had a better understanding, though maybe somewhat limited, as to the fact that when he became a Christian, conversion, something had happened. And we had a pretty good study with him. But you can't be just anything and look at God and say, I love you. Will you accept me? Or be a part of everything. Can you imagine a person saying, well, now, if all these churches are acceptable to God, and I believe in God and Christ and the Bible, I think this Sunday I'll be here at the Baptist church. And next Sunday, the Methodist church, the Presbyterian church, and a community church, and whatever else, I don't know whether you'd ever get back to one that you started with. There's so many out there today. But if that's all acceptable to God, wouldn't that be all right? Why should I just locate with one? Why not get the benefit of all of them? Since all these people, according to false doctrine of denominationalism, is accepting Jesus as their personal Savior, and they're just picking whatever church suits them, that's all all right. Why not just go and be a part of all of them? But that's not what the truth says, and I'm interested in the truth. Truth is objective. It doesn't change according to my feelings or whether they're good or bad or male or female or old or young or rich or poor. It's the truth that I'm interested in. The Bible says that Paul preached Christ and him crucified, and I can study through the New Testament and learn the details of that. He, he said, I, I don't want to know anything but Christ and him crucified among you. What does that mean? It means I, I want to know the gospel, God's power to save, because that's all that saves us. Nothing else does. What else would save you if the gospel, which the Bible says is God's power to save you, is that which saves you? What else can save you? What other religion or devotion can save you? Well, none. So if all good people will be saved, then the religion which one chooses is really a matter of complete indifference. But is that the case? Not if the New Testament's the final revelation of God to man, the complete revelation of God to man, but it's infallible. It is the body of truth that tells us uh, all things that pertain to life and godliness. First of all, we need to know that salvation is in Christ. Uh, we've quoted, and you know this passage very well, our Lord himself said in John 14, 6, that I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. And think for a moment. That theme is echoed time and time again throughout the whole of the New Testament. Paul wrote, by inspiration, saying God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself. 2 Corinthians 5, 19. That Jesus, our Lord, is set forth as the only means of access to the Father becomes quite clear if you accept the truth, let me emphasize truth, of the New Testament. In none other name, is their salvation. Notice, there's one God and one mediator between God and man, and that's the man, Christ Jesus. Acts 4, 12, 1 Timothy 2, 5. So there's only one person that offers salvation, not a multiplicity of them. I've never understood how people could be so determined to say there's one God. There's one Lord. There's one Bible. There's one gospel. There's umpteen jillion churches. <laughs> that, does that make real sense? It doesn't. And so I don't hesitate to repeat and say and emphasize 
There's many churches acceptable to my Heavenly Father as there are lords acceptable to my Heavenly Father. And there's only one of them. And he promised to build his church, Matthew 16, 18, which he did, as Luke records in Acts 2, and to which he adds all those that believe and obey his gospel from the heart, Acts 2 and verse 47. The dominant theme in our Lord's last will and testament, the New Testament of the Bible, is that Christ is the only Savior. If we were to be in a place like India today where there are umpteen Hindu gods or if we had lived as it was when the gospel was brand new in the first century where most people believed in all kinds of gods then we would probably see a strange look and maybe sometimes a very angry look or at least a what's wrong with you look when we would stand up and say there's one Lord, there's one faith, there's one baptism, there's one God and Father of all is above all, there's one Spirit. Because they are oriented totally for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years to accepting a multiplicity of gods. But here came the gospel message saying there's one God. Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. There's one Savior. And to add more consternation in their minds, uh, who is this Jesus Christ? Why, well, he's the fellow that was crucified on the cross. And you, you say he's God? I, I wonder how many times they must have walled their eyes to say the best when they heard that message about Christ. Yet, the proofs were offered. The evidence was given. And throughout the first century, people embraced it because they had nothing like that. For they had no hope. As Paul said, they were without God in the world. Because as I said as this morning, they, they didn't think about what we think about as to when we die of what happens then. It just wasn't on their minds. Or at least they had a skewed, false viewpoint of what transpired. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth on him should not perish but have eternal life. Now the whosoever includes everybody. No one's left out. If you're accountable to God for your actions, then Christ has the answer for you. Because all are under sin, Romans 3, 23, and sin separated them from God, there has to be a way back. And if it's not through Jesus Christ, as we look in the scriptures, we ask too, if it's not through Christ, well, where are we going to go? Think about it for a minute. Let's just say right now we learned that the Bible is untrue, that God doesn't exist, therefore Jesus doesn't exist. What are we going to do? There's nothing we can do. We just have to face whatever life has to offer in the flesh until it's over. When that ends it all. Different nationalities with different cultures are, are not given the multiple choice. Though some would like to say they do. They're not given the kind of Savior that suits them. There's only one and you have to bend your will to his will. And that's why then the Lord said, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Mark 16, 15 to 16. And Jesus spoke, I think, very clearly when in John 12, 32, he said, And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto myself. So when we preach Christ and Him crucified, when we preach the gospel, God's power to save, we're drawing people to God through Christ. For remember, He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. 
And Paul described Jesus Christ as the Savior of all men. 1 Timothy 4 and verse 10. If you ever do have the opportunity to go into a part of the world or among a people who don't believe in the God of the Bible or Christ being the Son of God and so on and preach to them, then you'll see a big difference from preaching to a, a bunch of denominational people who believe in God and Christ and the Bible and salvation of some sort. They just need corrected and right divided and word of truth and understanding how to ascertain Bible authority and how the Bible authorizes and getting corrected on the church and salvation. You have so much to already begin with with denominational people that you have in common. But when you go through a bunch of people who don't believe in the God of the Bible and you start preaching to them, it's a complete different, put in a common vernacular, a complete different ball of wax as to how they hear things. Men, women, boys, girls, without enlightenment from God, will in some way or another invent a God and they will worship. Now, if anything comes out of history to prove anything, it proves that. But it's still, as Jeremiah of old said, Jeremiah 10, 23, the way of man's not in himself. It is not in man that walketh to direct his stone steps. You know what that tells me? I better be afraid of David Brown. When should I be afraid of me? When I'm trying to figure out things for myself and ignore what the Bible says, that's when I better be afraid of me. <laughs> because the Bible makes it clear without revelation from God, without that instruction, there's no telling which way you're going to go. I remember one time my cousin and I, well, I have to back up for a minute and say, his uh, daddy had built a very elaborate chicken house. Now, that'll make some of you perk up and I say chicken. <laughs> and it, he had a sawmill, so he built a very good one. Well, after a while, they quit raising chickens, and my cousin wanted a clubhouse. I forgot how many acres they had, quite a, quite a few there. He inherited from his daddy. Right on the edge of his daddy's farm, we were about on that place all the time. They moved that thing off out in the woods, quite a ways. Couldn't even see their house from where he moved it. Set it all up, and it was a fine place to be. We camped out in that thing a lot of times. Well, we were out there one day, and it was Saturday morning. We were going to leave, going back over to his house. As we went out, two or three quail flew up. And like from here to the back door, there was a very large dead tree with not a limb on it. And that quail took off so scared to death, it ran right into that tree and knocked itself out. <laughs> now that quail had the ability to do a lot of things. And one of them was fly. But it didn't have the ability to run into that tree and not get knocked out. In fact, when I went and picked it up, it actually knocked some feathers off the top of its head. And I wonder if it killed the thing. Well, I think of us when we try to do things without going a proper direction. We're going to run into a tree, and there'll be more than feathers knocked off our head if we don't remedy the matter. And so it is, it is not in man that walketh to direct his own steps. Proverbs 14, 12 says, There is a way that seems right to a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Well, that's that quail about that. If I'd been wanting to have a quail, I had one in my hands and I wouldn't have even killed it out of season. Man by himself cannot devise a way acceptably to seek after God. <laughs> Acts 17, 27. And Paul appearing on Mars Hill made that very clear. He said, now God's not far from any one of us. And so he says, here's this altar of the unknown God he who you ignorantly worship, I'm going to declare him unto you. And thus revelation through God or through Paul as an apostle gave them the truth on that matter. God gives the directions for man. And we must be willing to be guided by those directions. Jesus summed it up in this way in Luke chapter 10 and verse 16. He that rejecteth me 
rejecteth him that sent me. Reject Christ, deny he's the Son of God. What have you done as far as the Father is concerned? You've rejected him. Point is this, our own goodness, whatever it is, is not enough. We must have Christ in the way the Bible says we have him. The true Christian would be a friend to the Hindu, the Muslim, the Buddhist, the Jew, and all others. But he's a friend when he shows them the Christ, as Paul did in his day and time. I don't know whether I mentioned this or not. I, over the last two or three weeks, things kind of run together, and I wasn't with you at times. But I was, I was reading, uh, or rather watching, a YouTube thing where a man who believed in Christ in Israel, who was a modern-day Israeli, was visiting with Jews who were not believers in Christ. And he was reading Isaiah 53. And they were speaking modern-day Hebrew, but they read the biblical Hebrew. And the man read Isaiah 53, and the people, the Jews, who were religious Jews that were listening to him, did not recognize it as from the Old Testament because they don't read it. They won't read it because it does speak as if it's perfectly describing Jesus Christ and what he did. He would read it, and then he would say, who does it sound like? Does it sound like anybody you've ever heard of? Well, they didn't know. But then when he began on a couple of them to explain further, then they said, well, it does. But yet they were religious. The people on the day of Pentecost are described as devout Jews gathered out of every nation under heaven. When you read about Cornelius, if you ever notice, it says he was devout. Same word in both cases, describing both of them. They're devout. Can't get better than devout when it comes to disposition of heart. But they were not acceptable to God, and they were, for their day, good people. They had to obey the gospel. They had to believe in Christ. So if we're a friend to these good people, our friendship doesn't mean that we approve or condone their false beliefs, but it does mean that we show them the way of righteousness. We show them the Christ. We show them the pure gospel. And yet I've seen a lot of folks who said, let's just don't bring that up. It'll upset folks. You might not realize it, but preachers, I could appeal to John here if he were here, because this happens, I've never talked to a preacher of the gospel. It didn't happen to, even among our own brethren is what I'm talking about. You bear down on a particular denomination or false doctrine, and maybe there's people in the audience who come from that background. And I've had members come out and say, don't do that. And I think Ken dealt with that in the old story about preaching on those witch doctors, not one of them in a hundred miles or a thousand. But you want to preach to the people the truth they need. You want to preach the truth people need to them, not what they don't need. The gospel of salvation that's in the scriptures is unique. When he said, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, he didn't say man-made doctrines, catechisms and prayer books and decisions of religious councils and so forth. When the apostles preached to Jews, you realize it meant they had to change their religion and sometimes they had to change a lot in their lives. Hebrews 7 and 12 and chapter 10 verses 9 and 10. And when they preached to non-Jews, Gentiles, that meant a change of religions, Acts 17, 22 through 31. And still in some places today, more places we like to think sometimes, people who decide genuinely to obey Christ, to be saved, 
really suffer a lot, if nothing else, cut off from their families and cut off from a number of things. Sometimes they just get themselves in bad trouble in all sorts of ways, even with the government. It's a wonderful thing to be broad-minded, but not to be so broad-minded you're a garbage can. It's nice to be uh, long-suffering with people, but long-suffering doesn't mean you're tolerant in the sense of, well, I'll never mention anything to this person wherein is contrary to the truth. We dare not allow our, if you want to call it that, broad-mindedness to debase or dethrone Christ. Christ is the only Savior, and he saves through the gospel in no other way, for it's God's power to save. And his gospel, without trying to go into it now, is unique. It's different from any other religious teaching in the world. There may be some things of other religions that you find in Christianity. But when you take the totality of the teachings of the New Testament, particularly pertaining to the gospel, it's unique. It stands alone. There's nothing else like it. The heart of the gospel is God's marvelous grace. And I'll not repeat the sermon this morning. And that grace is the epitome of it, the core of it, the fullness of it is seen with Christ dying on the cross. He tasted death for every man. By grace have you been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not of works, as we studied this morning, those works of the devil or the law, or what men come up with. Not of works, that no man should glory. That's the kind of works that you can't do. If I sat here and were to conjure up a way to go to heaven, then I could boast in that. I thought it up, and that's the way. No, it doesn't work that way. We are his workmanship in Christ Jesus. And we're created to be involved in good works. As the New Testament says those good works are. Pure religion and undefiled before God the Father is this. Now watch these works. To visit the orphans and widows and their afflictions and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. And that's a multiplicity of things. All of them involving action on your part and my part to be faithful in the church. And that's James who would say that faith apart from works is dead, being alone. And yet he talks about good works. Is there a contradiction here? Just remember this morning's lesson. Also reading Romans 5, 1 through 10, a little bit of lengthy reading. I'll cut part of it out. But being therefore justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom... Also, we have had our access by faith into this grace wherein we stand. Think about it for a minute. In Christ, we stand in his favor. But how so? Well, be thou faithful unto death. What does that mean? How do I equate being faithful and standing in his grace? Well, you're in his favor because you're full of faith. But faith comes by hearing the word of God. Romans 10, 17. And we walk by faith and not by sight. We walk as the word directs us, not as things appear to our five senses. Well, how can I stand in grace? I walk according to the word of God. And that way I'm faithful. But God commended his love toward us. And that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more being now justified by his blood, shall we be saved from the wrath of God through him. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more being reconciled shall we be saved by his life. Only Jesus Christ of Nazareth died for us. Only his blood can wash away our sins. Only through faith in him and his gospel system do we have access to the favor of God. The only people who are in a state of grace before God are members of the church of Christ as church of Christ is used and defined in the New Testament, Romans 16, 16. When people obeyed the gospel on the day of Pentecost, Jesus Christ, the head of the church, the one who purchased it with his blood, added those people to his church. 
There are no faithful children of God outside of the church of Christ as that term is used in the New Testament. If your mind is so blinded by denominationalism that you think any church must be a denomination, then I can understand why you'd say, well, you mean you're saying this denomination is the only one that's saved? That's not what the New Testament's teaching when it talks about salvation. When you read your New Testament, it's talking about Christianity or the church, and that's some 1,500 long years before there was the first Protestant denomination. Well, I want to be a member of the church Paul was a member of. The one Jesus built and purchased with his blood that Peter was a member of, James was a member of, that those people over there of Pentecost was a member of. And that's the church Jesus built. And I can read its identifying marks in his last will and testament. And I can know today what that church is. Because I can follow the divine blueprint in the New Testament and I can have it. People need to know that. But they're so steeped and have been for 500 long years in the concept that the body of Christ is made up of all these different denominations and denominations don't have a thing to do with your salvation. You just accept Jesus as your personal Savior. Then you pick a Bible-believing church. Well, if it was really a Bible-believing church, it wouldn't be a denomination. 1 Corinthians 1.10 makes it clear that God expects us on obligatory matters to be of the same mind and the same judgment. Now, that, can that be said of denominationalism? Be of the same mind and same judgment. No, it can't be. So even when division began to rear its head before the New Testament was fully written down, Paul condemned it. Let there be no divisions among you. So we're to be united under thus saith the Lord and the authority of the New Testament. We're to know what we ought to do and must do, and we labor to do it, not because that's what we think or the law of Moses taught or anybody else taught, but because Jesus Christ, his last will and testament depends on it. So salvation, forgiveness of sins, going to heaven depends on coming to Christ on his terms. Why acknowledge Christ as a Savior and King and Sovereign and then try to come to him on your own terms? Right at the very beginning of things, as I said several times today, Cain tried that. Cain worshiped God, but he tried it on his own terms. Abel heard what Cain heard, but believed it and obeyed it, and his offering was acceptable. That principle follows right on through, and it will till the end of time. You take God and his word, and you comply with it from the heart, and God accepts you. That seems so simple to me. Why let other people's views countermand that and set it aside? So as we bring the lesson to a close, we need to say, as it said in Hebrews 10, 22, let us draw near with a true heart, in fullness of faith, having a heart sprinkled from an evil conscience and having our body washed with pure water. The idea being, let us be humble from the heart obedient to the truth in becoming a Christian by being baptized into Christ as believers who repented of our sins and confessed our faith in Him. And then in Christ, for Hebrews was written to members of the church to remain faithful, doing those things pleasing to Him in the church that we might go home someday. You'll have one judge, and he'll judge you by one New Testament, John 12, 48, when we come before him on that last great judgment day. And he's going to judge you on the basis of the truth you have in your own hands right now. I close by saying, as we said this morning, there are people who say, well, don't judge me. God's already judged. I already know who's going to go to heaven. You do too. And that means I can know whether I'm on the way to heaven or not. And that's by examining my life in the light of the truth. If Jesus says I must believe in him or he'll reject me, that ends it right there. If he says to the believer you must repent of your sins, that settles it. If he says to the believing repentant person you must confess your faith in the Christ, well, that doesn't change a thing. That's just the three things one must do. And if he says to get into Christ, where he's located all spiritual blessings, forgiveness of sins being one of them, is to be baptized into Christ, Galatians 3.27, why reject it? Why fight against it? 
Why not just embrace it from the heart and become a Christian? Remember Naaman of old, 2 Kings 5? He got all in a dither and upset and all that kind of thing until somebody a little wiser than him said, now if he'd bid you do some great thing, wouldn't you have done it? Well, yeah. Well, then why don't you just go on down that old muddy river Jordan and do what he told you to do? Dip seven times. And lo and behold, he made up his mind to do that. And when he did, what happened? In that book written before time for our learning, his flesh came to him as a little child. Well, that's teaching us that we take God at his word and from the heart we simply and humbly and honestly obey him. Will good people be saved? Well, the only real good people are those that love the Lord and keep his commandments. That's the only way I know how to decide, define that. And if you haven't done that, then you're not what the Bible says you ought to be. And you can make a difference in that right now by accepting the truth and obeying it as we offer you this invitation and as we stand and sing.